OK, everybody, let's get started. Um, so how was the design document last week? Did you all finish it with no problem, maybe? So um, starting with this from this week, you should be doing the syscalls. So the way we suggest you do is that you first start with file syscalls, which is much simpler. And also, later on, when you do process syscalls, some of the um, syscalls like fork and exec v are, have dependencies on the file syscalls. So we recommend you to first start with file syscalls, then continue to um, process syscalls. So before we uh, uh, talk about the contents today, we first do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. Right? So we talk about the big picture of the syscalls. The questions, uh, I, I assume you now have a better idea of, the, of these questions. For example, how does a user trap into kernel space? Right? You already know that using the, using the syscall instruction. And how does a kernel know it's a syscall instead of other interruption? Right? You, or you also discussed that, or you also have to figure that out when you're answering the code reading questions. Right? You, we basically have a number assigned for each reason of the interruption. Some of them is timer interruption, others are syscalls. We basically have a, have a number to differentiate that, and the kernel just check that number to figure out what's the cause of the interruption. And also, how does a user pass the syscall arguments to the kernel space? And we, we already know that it's, from, it's through the argument registers, A0 to A, A3. right? And also, how does the user get the syscall result from the kernel? Yeah, we, already, we also already know that, that the kernel will put the results in the V0 and A3 registers, so user can get them. So here's the big picture of the syscall, basically the life cycle of the syscall. So suppose user want to make syscall, the user first put the arguments in the registers. This part is done by the compiler, so when you write a function that say open this file name with this flag, with this mode, the compiler will generate the assembly code that put these registers, sorry, put these values into uh, corresponding registers, right? And then it will, we have a syscall instruction to uh, trap into kernel to tell the kernel that we require some service from it. Then when the interruption happens, the hardware will first enter the privileged mode and then the hardware will save the context, basically figure out what just happened, and also save the user context. By user context, we mean the trap frame, which contains all the register values of the CPU. And then the hardware hand over this uh, to the kernel. The kernel first figure out what's the reason for this interruption. If a syscall, we dispatch this syscall to uh, relative handlers, use a big switch cast block, right? Then after we, done, we are done with the syscall, we collect the syscall results and put them in A3 and V0. And finally, we go back to user space where the user collects the results from A3 and V0. So this is the whole process of a syscall, right? So what you are supposed to, supposed to do is just one single step of this big picture, which is the syscall handlers, right? But it's important to keep other parts in mind so you don't get lost when you dig deep down into the syscall handlers. You always keep this big picture in mind. So today we'll mostly focus on the file syscalls. So we first discuss, discuss the file table design, and then we discuss a special file, which is a console, and then we walk through several, uh, some of the file syscalls. So before we can go on, any questions about this syscall big picture? I mean, by now, I assume most of you have a pretty good understanding of this. I mean, you are, you, you are supposed to discuss this in the design document, right? So I suspect, I, I assume you all know what's happening here. Um, so at the very beginning of this semester, I think in the third or fourth lecture, Jeff talked about the file handler abstraction, right? So uh, we said that there are three levels of indirections. So basically, we first have file descriptor, which is a green one. 
in the user space. That file descriptor is mapped to a file handle through a data structure called file table in kernel space. Right? All the red lines are in kernel space. Then you, this file handle are map, mapped to actual file object. Right? And finally, the file object is mapped to some disk, disk, uh, blocks on the disk. So we have this three-level kind of interaction. And why is that? I mean, so because different uh, levels have different um, sharing properties. For example, the file descriptor is private to each process, right? We already know that file descriptors is nothing but an integer. It can from zero all the way to, um, say, the maximum file descriptor limit in the system, right? It's just a uh, integer. So every process can have file descriptor from zero, one, two, three, four. Right? It's private to each process. And then we have file handle, which is also provided to each process, but it can be shared among some processes, not all the processes. So this kind of special relationship is um, through fork. So we know that one of process A called fork. After the fork is called, there will be two processes. One is process A, and the other is process B, which is A's child. Right? And A and B share the same, same file handles. So that's the only cases where file handles can be shared <laughs> across process. Otherwise, if no process call fork, then file handle will also be private to each process. Um, so so for, for file, file descriptor, we have exclusive private to each, each thread. And the file handle can be in some um, in some way be shared among processes. But the file object is shared system-wide. So suppose there, there is a file on disk and multiple thread or multiple user process open that file. They will share the same file object at the lowest level, right? So, so and at up, up layer, we have different file descriptors and file handles to, um, uh, to be access, accessed exclusively by that thread. But deep down at the physical layer or at the lower layer, we have the file object that's shared by multiple thread. So this, I, think, I assume you already know about. Um, so in OS 161, so the previous slides just talked about the high, some high level concept of the abstractions in file handles or file objects. Now in OS 161, what is these abstractions? For, so for file descriptor is just an integer, right? And then for file handle, it is supposed to be a structure. The structure is a C kind of jargon. It, it can, you can imagine as a class in Java and, and all that. Um, so the, the file handle should be a structure that it contains some process-wide file menu information. We will talk about it later of what exactly the information you need to keep in the file handle. And finally, we have the file object, which is already being provided to you. It's called vNode. We'll also talk about, it, talk about the vNode today. So speaking of vNode, so it's defined in this uh, header file. So vNode basically represents a physical file on disk. right? It per so we have uh, the vNode implementation already provided to you. And we also provide some helper macros to help you manipulate with the vNode, especially VOP read and VOP write. VOP stands for vNode operation, right? So when you implement your syscall, especially the read and write syscall, you might want to just use these macros to help you do the actual read and write. So let's take, take a look at where the vNode is defined. Um, <coughs> So it's defined in the vNode.h file. And you don't have to understand what's inside a vNode. So basically, the, some metadata can maintained over there is per file based. We don't need to care about what's inside a vNode exactly. What we care about is the, what kind of interfaces it provides, right? What, what kind of options we can do to it. So basically, we have a big blob of comments explaining the interface of the vNode. Basically, you have VOP open, VOP close. 
These two uh, you won't be using much because we have another VFS layer on top of Vnode, which provides more friendly version of open and close. So what do you um, need here is this one, VLP read, read data from the file to UIO, and VLP write, write data from UIO to the file. And also there is a final one called VLP try seek. It's basically try to modify the offset of the file handle, which you will be also be using in LSEQ. So this is three um, of VOP macros that are very helpful when you implement your own file syscalls. And you can see that um, it's provided through these macros. So you, you should be using VOP read, VOP write, and VOP try sync. And on top of Finode, we also have another layer called virtual file system. Right? It provides some other hyper functions which are very useful for other type of syscalls. So if you open that, um, we have a bunch of other useful functions among which you will find that some of them is, um, where is the VFS open? Does anybody know where is it defined? What's the header file for VFS open? Uh, VFS storage. How do you, oh, I missed it actually. It's, uh, no. That's type of line by me. Oh, here, here they are. Um, so here are some very useful functions that you can use when you implement your own syscalls, like VFS open and uh, VFS close, VFS uh, change directory, and VFS get current working directory. So, so you, now you should have a good sense of what you need to do, right? Most of the functionality, functionalities are already provided to you. For open, we have VFS open which takes care of the actual open the file. So what are you supposed to do is actually just add a, rep, add a wrapper to these um, low level functions. For example, open. You can imagine that most of the functionalities of open are already handled by VFS open. So what are you supposed to do, right? So first of all, you need to design what is in a file handle. And uh, so basically you need to decide what information you want to keep in the file handle. And also you need to design the file table. So basically, given a file descriptor, how do you find that file handle? And finally, you, the most important part of this assignment is argument checking, because you are dealing with the user and kernel interface. So whatever the value user passed in, you cannot trust. Right? You, can, you need to um, check the arguments very carefully and make sure they are correct. And then after this argument checking, you just, you just call the relative functions we have been provided to you to complete the functionality. For example, in, VS, VF, in this open case, you first check if the arguments is valid. If they are all good, then you just call VFS open to actually open the file. Then you just return whatever the file descriptor you decided to uh, use. Right? So that's the pattern for most of the file syscalls. Um, So any questions so far about the Vnode, how to use them? Yeah. Uh, for uh, the OP file Yeah. Does that actually do a seek if it's legal, or does it just return whether or not it is legal? I think it's just return whether or not it's legal, right? Remember that Vnode don't have offset information, right? Vnode is just a represent a, a file on disk. The offset information is kept somewhere else, actually in the file handle. Right. VLP try seek just tells you if it's valid to seek to that point. It doesn't, re it doesn't actually forward the file pointer. Any other questions? Okay. 
Um, so let's talk about file handle design. I mean, when you design the file handle, what kind of questions you need to consider? What kind of um, um, problems you are supposed to think about? So first of all, how do you tell where to read and write? I mean, if you look at the read and write uh, function declaration, you will find that first you have a file de descriptor, okay? So you know which file to read and write. Then you have a user space buffer, so you know where the data is coming from. Or in the case of read, where you should put the, the data to the user space, right? Then finally you have a length, which tells you how much to read and write. And there is no information to tell you where to read from, right? Suppose user tells, tells the kernel, hey, I want to read 100 bytes from this file. How, how can you tell where to start, where the, that 100 bytes start? Right? So that information is per process wide. Two process may open the same file, but at different location, read from different location. Right? So this kind of, if, of information that you need to keep in the file handle, so, you, so, so the kernel can remember which process read to, uh, to where. Right? So you need to uh, maintain an offset information for each file handle. So whenever you get a read or write syscall, you know where to start. So uh, typically, when, first, when the user first opens the file, you can set the offset to be zero, meaning that because the user just opened the file, so every read and write start from here. Then, suppose user read 100 bytes, right? So you start from zero, read 100 bytes, return whatever data, whatever data you, you have read, and forward that offset to 100. And next time, user say, hey, read another 100 bytes. So instead of start from, from the beginning, you start from 100 bytes because user has already read the first 100 bytes, right? So every time you read or write, you just keep forwarding the file pointer or the offset to whatever the new location is. So next time, you can start from there. So this is one information you need to keep in the file handle. And the second information is that how to prevent invalid read-write. Here, invalid, we don't mean that if the file exists and the file has a permission saying read only and user want to read as write, that's not what we mean by permission. So, so because at this point, we don't have a file system yet, so we have nowhere to check the permission of the file. Here, the valid mean that, okay, user want open a file as read only, right? Okay, it, we, we just um, permit that, we allow that. And later on, user call a write on this file. That we should, um, we should don't allow it to do because the user opened the file as read only, and now the user wants to write the file. That's not valid, right? You need to check against that kind of violation. Now imagine how would you do that? So you receive a write syscall. How do you determine if you can actually write that file or not? You need to check the flags, but in order to check that, but in read, you don't have the flags, right? How do you check that? Yeah, that's what the information should go into the file handle, right? So when user open the file, you should remember what the flags was used when user opened the file. So later on, when the user read or read that file, you can check the information you remembered in the file handle to determine if this read or write is valid. Right? So, so, so far we have two pieces of information that you need to keep in the file handle. One is the offset, another is the flag or the permission where user opens the file. And then, so how do you find the actual file object? I mean, you have a file handle. File handle are supposed to be mapped to a vnode, right? So you need to remember which vnode is associated with this file handle in this file handle structure. So now we have the offset, the flag, the window the pointer, which points to the actual file object. And finally, how do you, so that's the, three, the first three questions related to what should be in there in the file handle. And then the final one is, uh, is actually not quite relevant to the previous one, is when you destroy the file handle. So, you basically create the file handle when it's open. That's kind of intuitive to understand. But when you destroy the file handle, so typically the file handle is only accessed by one thread, 
or one process, right? So when user call close on it, you, are, you should be able to just destroy the file handle, right? That's, that's uh, only if, that's possible only if this file handle is not shared to other processes. But what if the file handle is shared by other processes? Can you just go ahead and destroy the file handle? Suppose two thread, A and B. A is the parent, B is the child. They, they both have one particular file opened, right? So now B calls close, but A hasn't, right? A should be able to still access the file because A hasn't closed the file, right? So at this point, can you just destroy the file handle? Y you can't, right? But how can, can you tell this kind of differences? How do you determine when you can destroy the file handle? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Actually, if you notice that we know the author actually also have a reference count, but that's called that's not that's just the count for the system wide reference count. The reference count in the file handle should be just the count of how many processes actually share in this file handle. So every time uh, you call fork, you when you copy the file table, you need to increment the reference count, right? So initially, when you open the file, the reference count should be one. Now, if you call fork once, this file handle can, will be shared by two processes. So you increment the reference count, and, and so on. So later on, when you close, you first decrement the reference count. So you only destroy the file handle when the re reference count is zero. Right? So that's the way how you can um, determine when is the right time to destroy a file handle, so that you can reclaim the file descriptor associated with that file handle. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. You basically, you are, you are referring to dupe two. That's only possible through the dupe two syscall. So yeah, that's right. So it's also possible that the same process have two file descriptors pointing to the same file handle. Right? In that case, you still need you also need to increment the reference count, right? So the, you, yeah, you, that's a very good question. So file handle can be shared within the same processes by multiple file descriptors or across multiple processes. Right? That's two kind of sharing scenario. But for both cases, you, also, you, you all need to maintain the reference count, whether it's shared within the process or across the process. Any other questions about the file handle design? So we basically settled one entry of the file table. Right, that's the file handle. Now, um, yeah, the final one is how do you synchronize? Of course, because whenever you have something that's shared by multiple processes, you also you you always need to consider synchronization synchronization issue, right? And uh, here you may template it to use read and write lock, right? Because it's natural that we we have read sys read we have sys write, so we may use a read or write lock to provide high efficiency or, or something like that. Actually, that's not correct, because what you want to protect is not the file, but the file handle. Remember that whenever you read or write, you need to f modify the offset of the file handle, right? The, so the offset is part of the file handle status. So no matter you read or write, you are always changing the status of the file handle. So in some sense, they are, they are all read writers instead of re readers. Right? Even you call this read, you, are, you, are still, you still will change the offset of the file handle. So in that sense, the sys read is also a writer. So you only have writers here. You don't have reader. So it doesn't make sense to use a reader and write lock. So you just probably want to use a normal lock to protect it. So now we have settled down one entry of the file table. Now we, let's move on to the file table design. So if you really think about it, you will, really, you will realize that the file table is nothing but a map, the high level data structure that is a mapping between the file descriptor and the file handle. So the interface or the requirements of this file table is simple, right? 
So first, we want to find available file descriptor to use. We have from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to maybe 1,000. Which one is available? Which one has been occupied? The file table should be able to tell that. Right? That's one requirement needed by the open function. Whenever you open the file, you want to allocate an available uh, file descriptor. And next, given a file descriptor, an integer, give me the file handle. Right? That's the requirement of read and write and actually all other uh, file syscalls. Right? And the final uh, requirement is that when you close that file handle, you should be able to recycle that file descriptor. So later on, when some process call open again, that file descriptor is available to allocate. So these are the three requirements to the file table. Now it's up to you to determine which kind of data structure you want to use. You can use an array, you can use a, a linked list, you can use a tree maybe. It's all up to you. As long as the, the data structure you use can provide these three functionalities, you can use that. Any questions on the file table design? So what kind of data structure you want to use? What's that? Array. Array, array is the most simpler one. So we can, how do you find available file descriptor in the array case? What's that? So you just scan the table, scan the array, right? Find available. <laughs> yeah. Actually, in, in, both in both array and linked list, you need to scan anyway. Isn't an array a more complicated type of linked list? What's that? What does it mean? Isn't like an array built off of linked list? No, not necessarily. So, so you have a file table, file handle, right, which is a structure. And you have a, a file table. It should be an array of. It should be. It can be an array of pointers, or it can be an array of actual file handle structure, right? So. Think about how you. How would you really do it? I mean, how would you find an available slot in the array? Would you? Don't you need to scan it? How would you tell the available file descriptor without scanning it? As the next available value. Yeah, in that case, you, you have a constant time allocation, basically. Every time you want to allocate the file, file descriptor, you use that value, then incre increment the value. But the disadvantage of that is that you keep increasing uh, although there might be some empty slot available in the previous one. Somebody may, may call close on the previous file descriptors, so you may have some slots available in the previous one, but you keep increasing. Then you need to recycle through that process. If you use the link list, you can always put the open one next to head. And then every time you look for it, you can always check the head. That's roughly the same with the with keep uh, current available file descriptor. But, but that's implementation details, right? So back, go back to the array case. Given a file descriptor, how do you find the file handle? That's simple, right? It's just uh, because the integer can be indexed to that array. So you find that file handle in constant time. And also, how to recycle the file descriptor. So whenever you close the file, suppose you are about to destroy the file handle, you just set the, that entry to be available. What's that? Yeah, if you have an array of pointers. So there's some implementation details that are up to you to, to decide. Yeah? Um, if you were to implement it with a linked list, how would you handle the um, requirement to like, lock when you add or remove a, um, when, when you're adding or removing a file descriptor? You mean how to synchronize it? Right. Because wouldn't you have to, if you did a linked list, wouldn't you have to um, lock? That's right. You, then you have, would have a big lock to protect the whole linked list. Because it's possible that this file table is shared by two processes. And two processes may call open and close at different times. So you have the whole big sharing issue. In that case, you have nothing but a, but a big lock to protect the whole list. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, we will get to that. So that's basically reserved for some special files, which is a console we will, we will talk about later. So when you're allocating the file descriptor, you always start from two, sorry, three, right? You start from three and growing upwards. So the final part is argument checking. As we have discussed that um, whenever you have a user pointers, you always need to use copying and copy out to deal with them. And you also need to check when the user wants to read or write a file, if that file descriptor is valid or not. And also, can you actually do the read or write, given the flex, given the previous flex used in the open syscall? And what kind of error code to return? So something may happen. You cannot read a file. User don't have a, a permission, or the file, uh, file handle doesn't exist. What kind of error code you should return, right? This kind of information you need to refer to the manual. That's the point of manual, which defines on which error conditions you need to return which error code. So that's kind of agreement between the user and the kernel, right? So user know exactly what to expect when something happened, when something wrong happened. Any questions so far about this part? Yeah. Did not we do that last time? I mean, copy, copy out. I won't explain that again. I mean, go back to the read the slides of last time. Basically, it's just a memory copy with actual protection. You can imagine copying, copy out has a try catch block, right? So try copying this stuff, but if something happens, let me know, and I want to catch that exception and handle it. So you can imagine that way. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll move on to the console, which is basically the file descriptor zero one two, right? The console you can imagine as, what, what is the console? This is the console, right? This is where you can type stuff. This is where you can see, see the output, right? So basically, the, is, the input is users type, uh, typing, and the out, output is what the program try to print. This is the console, right? So console is a um, special file in the sense that the console doesn't have the concept of offset. For normal file, you can specify from where and read how many bytes. But for console, you don't, you don't really have that concept. Whenever you write, you always append to the last of the file. Whenever you read, you always read from the user input. Right? You cannot say read user input starting from where we're. We don't have that kind of concept for the console file. And also, the console has uh, fixed file descriptors. So as we already mentioned, for a standard input, we have uh, file descriptor 0. For standard output, we have 1. And for standard error, we have 2. So these slides basically tell you two things. First of all, console is a file. So you can deal with console as you would do with other normal files. But the second meaning is that the console is special in the sense that it doesn't have this offset information and has a fixed file descriptor. So now you, you would, uh, and also the final special thing about a console is that the, they are considered to be automatically open for each user process. So for normal files, user would have to open the file first and do read or write on it, right? But the user program should be just write to the console without explicitly open the file. So when you write a C program, just a one line hello world, just a print of hello world, right? You don't have to open the console file and write to it. So it's considered to be automatically open for the user process. That's another special thing about the console file. So how do you initialize it? Well, because it's a file, you can initialize it as you would do with other normal files. So you will use VFS open, but with a special file name, which calls con column. This is the file name for the console file. Right? So if you call VFS open with this special file name, you will get a vnode. Right? So later on, when you write it to that vnode, something will be printed that content will be printed on the console instead of writing to some file on disk. And the flex, so we, have, we already know the, what's the file name for the console. The flex for the console, it depends on the, what kind of um, console you want to open. Right? For standard input, in, obviously, it's read only. You cannot write to it. Right? For standard output, it's write only. Right? 
and the same is standard error. It's also write only. And also, an, another question, a final question about the console is when do you initialize it? So you, you know how to open these console files, right? So um, because console is considered automatically open for each process, so you may tempt it to just whenever you create a process, whenever you create a process, you always open these three files for it, right? So for each process, you open these files. That is not a that that is not a correct because um, so the question to ask here is that first of all the console file is only needed by user thread right in the kernel at the kernel you just do whenever you want to print stuff to the console you just use kprintf right you you just you don't need to open the some file and write to it you just use kprintf to print some stuff on the screen. Right? So this console file abstraction is only used by the user thread. So because whenever you call fork, the file table will be inherited by the child thread. So what you need to do is just initialize these three file descriptors for that first, very first user thread. Right? For example, suppose you have opened that three files for the first user thread. And because the thread is, can be created only using fork, Right? So whenever you call fork, that three um, file handles will be shared among the child and grandchild of that first user process. This part is a little bit tricky, but um, it should be clear when you get go back go, when you um, reach the fork syscall where you need to copy the file tables. For now, you just need to remember that you cannot open these files multiple times for each process. You only need to um, copy them in the fork syscall. So, so at this point, if you haven't done any process syscall yet, don't worry this part uh, uh, for now. You can just leave it alone. But later on, when you, when you do the process syscalls, you need to consider this issue. This part, this part is tricky, I know, but you will know how to deal with it later on. Okay, any questions on this file, on this console part? So you know, you know how to open it, you know when to initialize it, which is at for the first user thread. Any questions about this? Okay, so finally, let's go over some of the file syscalls. So first, open. When open the file, the um, question you need to consider is that, so first you need to check if the file name is valid, right? That, that can be achieved using the copying. You just copy in the string. If, if anything goes wrong, copying will return an error code. You know that the file name is not valid, so just return some error code. And also, is the flag valid? For example, when you receive such a flag, Right? When the kernel receives the flag, say user say, I want to open this file both read only and write only. Right? How do you detect that kind of violation? You need to reject this kind of um, flags, right? Because you don't you don't really know what to do with it. It's conflicting. Also, so the flag should only contain one of the one and only one of the read only, write only, and rewrite. You need to, you need to ensure, you need to make sure that if the user if the flag contains more than two of them, then you need to return some error code about this invalid flag. And also, how do you find available file descriptor that depend on your file table design? Right. And also, when you initialize the file handle, one uh, question you need to ask yourself is, what's the initial offset? So we said that typically, the initial offset is just the start of the file, zero. Right? But some, there is a one special flag called open append. Right? Say I already have a file that is 100 bytes. I want to open the file in the append mode, meaning that I open the file. When I write to it, I don't want to overwrite the content of it. I just want to append my content to that file. In that case, what's the initial offset? End of the file. Right? 
but you need to figure out how to find out the end of the file. Right? There is one um, um, function, I don't remember the name, it should be view, VFS stat. It's called VFS stat, which basically gives you statistics of the file. And that statistics contain the size of the file. So it, you need to detect if the flag contains the append flag. If it contains the append flag, you need to set the initial offset to the file size instead of zero. That's one tricky thing about the open. Close is simple, except for one thing is one to destroy the file handle. We already discussed this. So you basically need to maintain a reference count to the file handle. And only close the file, destroy the file handle when the count reaches, reaches zero. And for read and write, because we already have VUP read and VUP write to actually um, perform the actual read and write for you. So yeah, before that, you need to first check, of course, whether user can read or write, given the flags. And here's the difficult part, which is UIO, right? I, I guess most of you are confused of how to use the UIO. Um, so, so the way to use a VUP read and a VUP write is that you first initialize the UIO. Basically, this UIO contains all the information it needed to perform the read or write, right? So we have IO vector. If you go to the definition of the IO vector, we find is um, it has nothing but a base and a length. Basically, IO vector specify a region of memory, um, a region of buffer in memory. So it has a base address. It has a length of that buffer is. So this IO vector basically specify where the data is uh, or where the buffer is. When you read, it specify where to put the data you, you, have, you have read, right? When you write, it specify which data need to be written to the disk. This is the IO vector, and typically we just uh, use one IO vector per UIO structure. So this count should be one. And we have an offset. This offset basically specified where this UIO should start in the file. So this is offset into the file. And we also have a resit, which basically specify how much bytes, how many bytes should be read or write. So IO vector specify the memory part, which, which is either the data you want, to, you want to write to disk or you, the buffer you want the data to be in after the read. And the, the offset and the resit specify the file part. Basically, specify where to start, where to read or write, and how many bytes to read and write. And then we have we have a segment enumerate, which basically can be um, user instruction, user data, and a system space, which is for kernel. Um, we have uh, enumerate telling whether this is a read or write operation. Finally, we have a address space. So once you understand what's inside the UIO, you, you, have, you, you can know how to initialize it properly to actually perform the IO. For example, say user want to read 100 bytes into some buffer, right? So this IO vector should be pointing to that user buffer. And this offset and the resident should be, offset should be the, the offset in the file handle. And the resident should be 100 because you want to read 100 bytes, right? And the segment flag should be user data, which is the user space. And RW should be read, right? And the IUIO space should be the address space of the current thread. So once you initialize the UIO, you can just call a VUP read, use this UIO to, pop, to do the actual read actual read. Any questions of this part? I mean, it's very important to understand the UIO structure to, you, um, to implement the read and write sys call. And error seek. So the only trick part of error seek is the 64-bit argument parsing. We already talked about last time, right? And also, 
how do you calculate the new offset? That's basically just to read the manual, and it will tell you what the what the once means, where to start, how many bytes to go over or before that. And if, and if, and you will want to use the try seek to determine if that seek is valid or not. Dupe two. Um, so dupe two is, in some sense, is very similar to CV in the sense that the implementation is quite simple. If you read the manual, you will know exactly what need to, what you need to do inside dupe two. So the manual says dupe two clones the file handle belong to the old FD onto the file handle belong to the new FD. If the new FD is open, just close it. So that's kind of confusing to read at first, but you, if you look at, you really figure out what does the mean, it's actually very simple. So suppose this is your file table looks like before the dupe to syscall, right? We have old FD point to one file handle, we have new FD point to another file handle. After dupe two, what will happen? What's the, what's the file table looks like? So we want the new FD also point to the file handle of the old FD. That's what we call a clone the old FD onto the file handle of new FD, right? So after dub2, the, the, the file table and file handle will look like this. Both old and new file, uh, file descriptor point to the same file handle of the old file descriptor, right? And this, this file handle that previously was point, pointed by the new FD was closed. Because in this case, this is opened, so the, the menu said, if it's opened, it should be closed, right? So this is the, the changes before and after dub2. And here is one example that why we want such a weird kind of interface, right? Suppose you want to write a simple echo command, which we have already shown echo hello. It's just a print. Uh, it does, it's very simple that it just print whatever you typed in, right? So the, the most simple echo that see would be like this. We just print the first arguments and we do nothing else, right? So a shell um, that see would maybe like this. So I first fork a new thread and in the new thread I call exact V on the echo and, and in the old thread I still I wait on this child. So this, so this is one minimal example of the echo share command, the, the minimal implementation. Now suppose I don't want to print to the console. Instead, of, instead of, of that, I want the string being read to a file, right? So we, we, also, we already know that we can use IO redirection to uh, redirect the output of the program to a, sp uh, to a separate file. For example here, I, if I do this, uh, so you will, you will see nothing being printed out, right? But if you open the file, temp hello.txt, it's, it's here. So the output, instead of, being, instead of being printed to the console, is being redirected to another normal file, right? So the question is, how do you implement this without changing echo.c? Right? Because shell may have multiple programs that want to do this kind of IO redirection functionality, right? It's not uh, efficient to implement this function, functionality in each of the files. For example, you don't want to modify echo.c, oh, you, you don't want to modify echo.c to taking care of, okay, uh, whether it's a redirect or not. If it's redirect, I open the file, and instead of do printf, I write to the file, right? You don't want to do that. I mean, um, so, that's why we have a, such a syscall called div2, right? Note this highlighted lines we added here. So in the new thread, instead of just a call exact v, we first manipulate the file, hand, file table a little bit. So we, we first open the file, hello.txt, then we call div2. Remember how div2 operates, right? So here, the old FD is the FD point to the file, which is the hello.txt. The new FD is std out, standard output. If we call dup2 like this, the file table will be looked like this, right? So in the, in the child process, in this case echo command, it's still write to the standard output. But that write is actually performed on this file, 
instead of the console. So this is one example of how Dupe2 can be useful to implement such uh, functionality. That's basically what I got today. And we can discuss any questions offline here. I guess, I guess we're running out of time. Okay, okay. thanks.